Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Anne Rigg Space for Photography. My name is Svetlana Yashkova, and it is my pleasure to introduce From Behind Closed Doors to Hashtag Me Too, a conversation between Donna Ferrato and Nona Willis Aronowitz. Before we begin, please remember to silence your cell phones. Donna Ferrato has published four books of her photography, including Living with the Enemy, which chronicled domestic violence and its aftermath. It included the image behind closed doors, featured in our current exhibit, which Time Magazine called one of the 100 most influential, influential photographs of all time. Nona Willis Aronowitz is an author and editor who writes about women, sex, politics, and the state of young feminism across the United States. She was the features editor for Splinter, and her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and New York Magazine, and among many others. Tonight, Donna and Nona will talk about the progress of women's agency over, years, over the years since Donna's work brought the subject of domestic violence to the fore, and how the Me Too and Time's Up movements have altered both societal understanding and personal experience of that agency. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Nona and Donna. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so I know this was sort of advertised as a Q&A, as in I ask the questions and Donna provides the answers. but. We're going to do things just a little bit differently, and um, actually, I'm going to ask Donna to sort of ex explain um, the origin story of why I'm even here. Ah, I'm glad and, you asked that. <laughs> and, the, and, and sort of the setting is like the height of the Me Too movement, lots of different opinions are flying through generations, um, and then, yeah, then Donna ask, gets asked to do this. Well, you know, I got a phone call from David Scharf and uh, asking me to to do this lecture, and he said, you know, um, you can have anybody you want to interview you for this lecture. And I said, anybody? <laughs> and he said, yep, I'll make it happen. Well, right away I said, I want Frances McDormand. <laughs> And uh, I said, i got to have her. She's the coolest. Uh, she's the only one I want to talk to. And he said, well, okay, I'm going to do my best on it. <laughs> so he, you know, he put himself into the task. And then she won the Academy Award. And so he called me up and he said, I don't think we're going to be able to get Frances McDormand. Donna, who else do you want? And I was thinking and thinking, because I know a lot of cool people that I'd like to have a conversation with. But... On February 18th, which was, it seems like 10 years ago, actually, of this year, um, I read an article, it was an op-ed piece in the New York Times by Nona. I'd never met her, but I loved this piece so much. It was about feminists and young feminists and what they're looking for sexually. And it really struck a chord with me because I think this is one of the big problems that young women are having today because they they don't really know what they want sexually. And so I said, can you get me Nona Willis Aronowitz? And he said, I don't know, I'm gonna try it. I said, <laughs> okay, do that. Well, it, it took him a long time and I was beginning to think, she doesn't, she doesn't want to talk to me. And I was very sad. And then maybe three weeks later, you finally answered his, his email. Right? Well, yeah, I was doing like a desert lady thing, which I felt like was very Donna appropriate. Um, <laughs> but we didn't know each other. Yeah. Well, I, just, I like, would have been doing it with you. <laughs> but then we started to hang out, and the more and more that we hung out, um, I realized that the reason why you asked me to do this is sort of the crux of like your pers the way that you reacted to it was sort of the way that you reacted to the Me Too movement. And as I got to um, know your f photographs, which are sort of ambiently in the background here, um, just, the, you know, um, an hour ago you were saying that, you know, a lot of women who you photograph have been through just brutal circumstances, pain and suffering. And you, so you said that the difference of between those women and the women that... that were really sexually self-possessed and, and sexually free were that somehow, like, when you have that sexual power, you have power in other aspects of your life. Absolutely. 
I and mean, that's, that's my credo. Well, like, th how, do, how do we sort of um, differ differentiate between somebody who has power and somebody who, d like, how, how do you know, like, when somebody has sexual power and, <laughs> and somebody who doesn't, and if you suffer, does that mean that you're not sexually possessed? Sexually if you self-possessed. If you suffer, does that mean you're not sexually possessed? Um, first of all, I think that part of women's great power comes from the suffering that we go through, the pain that we experience, what we give, what we give with our bodies, our minds, our hearts, everything. We give 100%. And we are no strangers to pain. We experience pain as young girls when we first go into menopause. And for some women menstruation. and girls, I mean, yes, <laughs> menstruation, you know, menopause is actually not so bad too. And, you know, we can talk about that. But, I, you know, I think that all of these changes that women go through are ex exhilarating and they're powerful and they define who we are as, as women, as human beings. And I, I think that suffering is very much a part of our life and we learn how to do things, even when we're suffering, even when we're, we are, we're going out of our minds with either hot flashes or really heavy flows, period flows. We, you know, we have to deal with all of this stuff as well as keep our, our families going, our jobs going, our creative, I mean, it's all in one. We're very refined extraordinary packages, we women. And so I'm not really against the suffering. I just think that we, we make a mistake when we allow, or we, we not just allow, but we get into s relationships with people who are making us feel really bad about ourselves. And we continue with that. And we don't break it. And even when we can break it, we go back. So this has always been, I mean, I really feel that women who are sexually in touch with what feels good to them, they're not looking for a man to come in and say, this is how you need to make love to me. This is how you have to give me a blowjob. This is how you have to do this and this and this. And I want you to sleep with my other girlfriends. And, you know, they're putting a lot of demands on women these days, you know, to be like the girls that they see in porn sites and you know and a lot of young women they just don't know who they are sexually and that's a big problem that we're going through with right now and why I liked your your op-ed piece so much because you you address that very clearly and yeah, well, I'm, I was really struck by, so, so basically if you're not, I'm, I'm sure most people here are familiar with Donna's work, but I basically see it as like there's a lot of suffering on one hand and then there's a lot of ecstasy on the other. And those, those pieces are sort of saying like it, there doesn't, it doesn't have to be this complicated. Like there can be pleasure even in this world that sort of beats us down, like we can find pockets of pleasure. There's sort of like an alternate reality that we could be living in more of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like as I've talked to you more and more, you get so frustrated with women who don't understand that, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I think the, the closest thing we've ever had to sort of a disagreement is talking about sort of like both the women who have been um, victims of Me Too, and or or you know young women who might be p potential victims of like a leery boss or something, and then also the women who are complicit in um, watching it happen and not saying anything. Can you explain a little bit more like why you're so like frankly angry at those women? Yeah, I really am. I'm really angry with women like Matt Lauer's wife and qu quite a few of them actually because. I feel, Rihanna, you know, I feel like with a lot of these women, they condone the abuse for so long and they keep giving these men an excuse to continue with this kind of behavior that's hurting a lot of women, not just them. It's devaluing and hurting so many women. And if the women who meet these men don't recognize what's going on, and they do recognize it, they see what's happening. None of the women are blind to it. But instead of glamorizing it, we have to be very clear that this, this kind of behavior 
is not acceptable. It's not acceptable in any way. And, and so for some of the women, like, like Rihanna or like Matt Lauer's wife or so many of them, um, you know, they keep going back again and again and again, and this is a problem. This is what creates the monsters. And I want to see something, I want to see that, that, that spirit in women that I know is in there to stand up for what they know is right, for what they want for themselves, and not just for themselves, for their children, but for other women. I want to see them doing something for other women too, because if they don't stop it for themselves, these men become monsters, and they continue on that path because they get away with it, because the courts don't really stop them, the police don't stop them, many times their own families, their mothers, their fathers, nobody's stopping them. Yeah, but We have to. But We God. have to. <laughs> I really believe that women have the power to do this. But so this is like basically what um, the main generational divide really is in... in I guess we can say Me Too movement, but in, in general terms, like how older women pursue or, or perceive, like whether it's sexual assaults or domestic abuse or whatever, versus how younger women perceive it. Um, because now there's all this vocabulary like, don't blame the victim, or like, don't sort of like put all this on women, like men have to change too. And I, and like, I, I don't actually put you in that category. I think you're like so much more <laughs> complicated than that because like, I don't know, you just heard what she sort of like had to say and it was very, um, you know, like you, you're not taking any bullshit from any of these women, you don't have, you're not letting them have excuses, but like you would think that you'd kind of be one of those feminists that was like, women don't need anybody, they're independent, they're strong, like they don't, like they need to just sort of like be, you know, on their own and like I, all, I see so much in your work um, the whim, the like a woman as the role of caretaker, and like a woman as part of sort of like a bigger story besides herself, and like um, like being kind and like loving towards people. Um, and I guess I want to know, like, sort of, do you see that in modern feminism? You know, I, you may think that I'm kind and loving and all that kind of crap. Not you. I mean, like oh, you are you, actually. I'm really not. I'm really well, not. I'm brutal. Well, you so know? you you have both like kind and loving and brutal qualities, but like m more importantly, <laughs> more importantly, your work also does. Like it's like you know, like the more the more famous stuff or like that famous photo that we were talking about from Time Magazine is really like witnessing a woman's pain. But then you have. Um, like, can we put that childbirth picture, the slide eight, um, of of uh, of your daughter? Yeah. Like, here's your daughter. Yeah. Yeah, giving birth <laughs> at home. At you know, home. I gave birth at home to Fanny, and of course, you know, I, as a woman, I try to set an example for all women of all ages. And you know, Fanny saw that it was a good thing to be born at home, so of course she had her child at home, but. I had a I had a party going on when I was having you know my daughter, so it took me 48 hours to deliver her at home. <laughs> Fanny was we we kind of controlled the environment, and she delivered in six hours. Oh wow! <laughs> you know. Well, yeah, I mean, you probably know. lots of ins, lots of outs. Yeah, but so um, no, I mean it's but Fanny's nothing like me, nothing. Fanny's I mean, a very like strong, independent. That, that She's very role. much of a caretaker, perhaps even more than I am. Um, my, she takes after my mother, who is the caretaker. I've always said, you know, I've had a lot of men in my life. I've had a few husbands, not husbands, but men that I've lived with. And the one thing I make very clear in the beginning is that I will never be a man's caretaker or nursemaid or anything. I'm not going to do a man's work for him. I do my work, he does his work, we help each other if it can be like that, but I'm not going to be a caretaker. Mm -hmm. And I see that my mother has always been that, and it didn't work out too good for her because my, my father was not a faithful man, and he caused my mother a lot of stress. He was not abusive, but he had, you know, he wasn't honest with her. Mm -hmm. And I wanted her to leave him. I, I really did, and I tried to push her to do that. But she stayed, and she stayed, and she never knew other, any other man in her life. Mm -hmm. And that makes me sad. Yeah. Because Wait, I think there are a lot of beautiful men out there 
who really don't get the attention from good women, not enough. Um, can we show that, uh, that photo that you took of her little note? Um, mm -hmm. I think it's like, it's early, right? It's like slide four, maybe. And this, this slide note was nine. just written about three months ago. My mom is 93 now. She's one of the strongest, most independent women that oh, I, no, I've ever it. known. I don't oh, know, no, that's no. not it, sorry. No. Um, I was just sort of, you might have seen it, sort of, you might it's see it. It's a door, it and it has a little note on it that says, Donna, don't strip your bed, I'll do the bedding. And she was 94, was she? Wrote Oh, it no, it hasn't come up yet, oh, but okay. it will. It so will. now you're going to see it. This is the picture that Nona loves so much. I love it so much. much. She yeah. has pictures of women who have like gone through some crazy shit. She has pictures of her own birth of her daughter. She has like sex party pictures and all yeah. this crazy shit. <laughs> and, the th and the thing that really got to me was this note that her mom, her 94-year-old mom put on the door. And it's like... It's like you don't pity her. You, you say no. this now. But it makes like me mad because I want to make my own bed. I want to <laughs> strip my own bed. I don't want my mama to do this. Yeah, but she won't let me. My mom won't let me help her. She helps everybody. My mom has got that, 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 that core of her is to be a caretaker. Yeah. The only thing I'm living for is that someday she may need me and she will let me feed her and bathe her and maybe carry her in my arms when she can't walk See, anymore. She's a caretaker. <laughs> I um, love my mama so much, but she's very tough. She doesn't show. She doesn't show pain. She never complains. Mm -hmm. um, can we actually go back to slide four? Because it kind of reminded me. This is like, a, besides, again, like there's nobody even in this photo, but this was you uh, drinking champagne from a paper cup. This reading, is Paris. Reading the New York Times in Paris after yeah. her second abortion in 1977. And this, again, it like doesn't have these like intense images, but it really struck me because I saw this photo a couple of days after we found out that, um, you know, the Supreme Court was going to be reshuffled and Roe v. Wade might be on the line. And it was sort of this photo that was very, like, if you look, you don't even see the champagne in the, in the photo, so maybe I'm just projecting on it, but it just is this, like, casually idyllic picture of the way it could be if we weren't so... Um, Protestant. Unkind. Episcopalian. <laughs> Protestant. <laughs> if we weren't being overtaken since the late 70s by the religious, I call them the Im immoral majority, <laughs> These people who think that they have the right to tell women what to do and when to do it with their bodies. Um, this, yes, I, I get really inflamed about this. And, and, and I feel like it is a huge responsibility for women, my generation, who fought for these laws to be changed so that we would be able to, you know, be in charge, we would have that kind of agency over our own bodies, our bodies ourselves. We, we don't need anybody to tell us what to do, when to have a baby, when not to have a baby, how to wait for it, you know, who, who to have the baby with. We don't, you know, we, we need protection only insofar as the laws will protect us so we can decide when it's right for us to be with whoever we want to be with, and we can have a baby or not have a baby when we know we're ready for it. We can handle it. Because having a baby is such a beautiful thing. It's such a gift. It's such a gift from the mother of God. Not from God. God doesn't make any miracles. Women make the miracles. And the other one thing that really drives me crazy is the goddamn Catholic Church's version of this oh, yeah. Trinity thing. Yeah. <laughs> that it's a Holy Father, a Holy Son, and a Holy Ghost. Can we put slide nine on? No woman. <laughs> no woman in there. Why have women... I am a little bit pissed off with women. Yeah. Since the beginning of time. Why have we put up with it? Well, why have we accepted this? Well, that we are invisible. Why? Um, can we put on slide nine real quick? Um, I just feel like what, what I want to talk about... Um, your relationship with religion because, um, can we put on slide nine? 
Is that possible? Which one is that? That's the nun picture. Oh, You know, I love that picture. I had an (laughs) orgasm when I took the nun picture. I have to tell you, I had stalked that nun for about 20 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) So Donna had an orgasm. She took this picture. Here's this couple that's just like so positive and in love and just having a make out. And then there's this sort of disapproving eye of this... um, like because yeah, Catholic yeah woman. I was I I'd been I'd been stalking the lovers for about three hours, but I ne- I knew I needed something. This was in Venice, Italy, and so then from a long ways off I see this nun coming. And I said, Yeah, she's the one. She's the right element. <laughs> so I started walking beside her, not looking at her. My camera was on my shoulder, wasn't looking at all. And but as soon as she crossed the 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 direction with the lovers, I, I whipped around, and my camera was ready, and I took this one picture, and I saw her hand go down like that. Honest to God, it just, like, my body just, you know, went in exploding from head to toe. That was it. That's what it's like when you make that picture, when you know what you want. You don't know exactly how you're going to get it. It's not like setting up a picture. It's working with the forces around you. It's like anticipation. Anticipation is a really big part of making strong photographs. Because in a way, you almost have to have it in your head. And and then you go after it. And and like for me, the most important picture for all of these ones that you're looking at tonight is the first one. The first one where you see me as a young woman back in 1977, and I'm in my mother's bathroom, and my mom and dad were like going through some changes. I didn't know what was happening. My two brothers, they were much younger than me. We didn't know, but everybody was leaving Lorain, Ohio, and they were moving to Colorado. And so I just went in my mom's bathroom and locked the door, and I put her pattern in my hair to make me into an old woman. I always wanted to be an old woman. I always hated being a young woman because I knew that nobody takes young women seriously. It's just, you know, oh, you're so cute, and we get patted on the head. And, but I, I just wanted to, like, say, I'm coming. I'm whatever's coming, I'm going to be there. Okay, so I did this portrait, and then through the years, this is some, like, 40 years later, those bolts formed in the film coming out of my (laughs) head. That's why that's so important. That's why when I look, when I'm looking around and I see something that I want as a photographer, these bolts, like, they're coming through my eyes. When you see me in my house with all those young girls, I have a lot of young girls who come to me when they're 12, 10, they just hang out in my house. They grow up with me. They're, I meet their moms. They're okay. Girls in the neighbor. Wherever <laughs> I go uh, speaking or taking pictures, I meet these amazing, powerful, young women, girls. And I look at them really strong because I don't want them to make a lot of stupid moves. We all have to make mistakes. That's a given. Mistakes are great. But I don't want them to make the mistakes that are going to cost them a lot of time and are going to hurt them a lot. You know, like my daddy used to always say, it's okay to make mistakes, Donna. He was a heart surgeon, and he said, but you don't want to make a mistake that's going to cost somebody their life. So you have to think really carefully, whatever you do. Be mindful that whatever you do could cost somebody their life or could set them in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've always tried to do. I I don't want anybody to lose their life because of me. I couldn't do that kind of war photography where you get people killed. Mm-hmm. And even though I've taken a lot of pictures of women, like this woman here, who was being hunted by her ex, I moved in with her. I, wouldn't, I would not move in with her until she left him. I would not start anything with this young woman. I, I'd met her father online. He told me what she was going through. I knew it was really bad because this guy had gotten snuck into her bedroom as a young girl when she was 13 and got her pregnant. And then, and then her father, who I was only like a pen, like these were the early days of the internet, and I was, 
it was even crazy how he found me. Uh, he was a, he was a, a bookmaster, and he was looking for. A, some books that had a woman named Donna as a photographer, and that's how he found me. So he was telling me about his daughter, who was only 13, and he said, someday you should photograph her because she's beautiful. Then the next day, the next time he wrote, he said, she's, she's gotten pregnant, and she's going to go off with this guy. And I begged him not to let it happen. And he did. He and his wife didn't know how to stop her, and she went off and started living with him. And the story is explained in the next, the next card. But he wanted me to come back and spend time and photograph, but I, I really couldn't do it until she was ready to leave him. But then I moved in with her. This is in Tennessee. And off and on, I spent three years with this woman and her children, making a story about her life and how she was able to get over it. And you say, you know, you asked me the question, like, how can we be so tough on women in these relationships? And Especially since you really have been in their space and take the time absolutely. to get to know her. And you're not just making a snap judgment. I'm, sometimes I am surprised that you're like, come on, just yeah. leave us. <laughs> come on. You know? But, you know, oftentimes it's like with, with Sarah. They stay and stay and stay, even though they try to run away many times. They, they, they go back, and when they go back, the violence gets worse. And then they start hearing, eventually, that they're going to die. They, they get it, that if they stay any longer, they're going to die. And that's yeah. when they go running. Yeah. But when they're running and trying to start their life over, they have so many problems, physically, emotionally, psychologically. They have, you know, the post-traumatic stress symptoms. They... It's a long time. It took her many years before she could get over that, and she still suffers. Yeah, but uh, you no, know, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. I just wa don't want you to forget. Like, I, I think like this is so interesting that you framed this in um, the sense of like I've always wanted to be an old woman and uh, like yeah, and and sort of like make sure that younger. Girls, uh, I love this one. We're going to come back to that. Um, <laughs> how, how many people in here know Al Goldstein? Wait, we're going to come back to it, Donna. I have the slide, good, the good, slide, good. Na <laughs> slide name right here. It's fine. <laughs> um, but like that you sort of frame it this way of like, actually, can we go to um, slide 56 while we're talking about this? Because I just feel like you have this I only sense wanted to put this in because of Donald Trump. Yeah. Because I think he's a much nicer, Al Goldstein's yeah. a much nicer pussy grabber than yeah. Donald Trump. Um, this woman, she is like clearly the most sort of like in, ob in obvious ecstasy of any of these people, um, like with the exception of maybe your daughter like giving birth, um, than any of these people on these slides. And she's also probably the oldest. Um, and I just like found her to sort of just be like the closest, like you, you, you like issue the Catholic Church and all these like organized religions and I just feel like this woman is like your religion. Like an old, oh, yeah. an old woman who's like extremely sexual who also will like be a caretaker to young girls and make sure that they, that they can be like this when they're 76. You know? We can only hope so. <laughs> okay, so yeah, let's talk about that. Uh, we can go to back to slide 30, um, the Al Goldstein pussy grabbing. You know, when I first saw this piece, um, I thought it was sort of sinister. Like, I, all I think of when I see pussy grabbing is Donald Trump and, like, oh, uh, like, that woman probably has some fake smile because she, like, you know, like, has to... Put up with it. Put up with it, yeah. Um, but, like, basically the context was, like, this national conversation about pussy grabbing. But then, like, when I happened to sort of bring it up and ask you about it, you were like, no, that's not what it's like at all. And I'm wondering sort of, like, can you tell the, the context yeah, of this? Yeah, no, this is, not, this is not offensive to me. I mean, first of all, even you look at how he's touching her. It's, he's not grabbing her like Donald Trump was bragging about doing, you know, sort of like reaching in there and grabbing. He's touching her in a very gentle way. These women, they, they know him, and they're actresses, and they're... And he's, he had blue, night, blue Midnight or something, a, a porn station. So he'd been around for a long time. He was a really great character who was also a civil liberties kind of guy, oh, always yeah. fighting for the rights, like, um, like Larry, uh, Larry Flint. Flint. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, Larry Flint is an also incredible character, too, because he was a very faithful, loyal man. 
Mm-hmm. You know? Did um, you ever photograph him? I didn't. No, I wish I had actually. But no, Al Goldstein, I, I knew him pretty well. He never made me uncomfortable. He was he was not a sleazy guy. He was he, he had a sense of humor and he was really smart. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, this is he's he's almost just doing this like, hey Donna, okay, look, I'll touch your you know, but it wasn't. It was not a very disturbing image to m- or moment to me. Yeah. But I'm interested that you know, for you, it made you really uncomfortable. I mean, only because that it was so on the nose of being something we'd been talking about for so long. But that's like kind of what then. When then once you explain this to me, like I really appreciated it because I think your work, like. Um, documents a lot of sort of like self-proclaimed like promiscuous like slutty women who like are totally are totally fine with like any of those monikers and that like just because like it's just so the op like this this photo being like a positive portrayal of like casual like sort of mutual sexuality is like (laughs) really inspiring because it's like it's not it's like I guess that even I who like consider myself like a very pro-sex feminist have been sort of conditioned to think that like if a porn star is like getting groped by some older dude in a, in a photo, then it's automatically going to have some sort of sinister meaning. And again, this is sort of a photo that's like, that's like, actually, it doesn't have to be that way. Like you can have these sort of like not fraught, like sexual situations with <laughs> like members of the opposite sex. And, and it's, it's playful. And it's, you know, this is not, you know, the difference between a lot of the men who've been brought down by the Me Too movement is that the real issue was that they had power and they had privilege and they had a lot of it and they used it. And, and women just felt powerless to really, like the poor woman with Matt Lauer, when he brought her into his office and locked the door and then put her by the desk and pulled her pants down and started to have sex with her, she fainted dead away on the floor. She fainted. That didn't stop him. That didn't stop him. Yeah. And th- these are the things that, you know, I'm sure she must have told somebody in the office that this was happening. I'm sure that more people knew. Well, you never know, though, because like you said, like you really would like women to, to be able more. to... But there's so many reasons why they don't, and it's not just because they're not brave enough. It's because they see other people doing it, and they see the consequences. And it maybe until Me Too, where things are sort of starting to change, um, usually you pay for something like that. Like and good. I used to get fired from jobs all the time because I would report my boss when he'd put his hands up my skirt, and I'd get fired. And so what? You know, we're women. We can keep going on. We can keep finding other jobs. We can do other things. We, we have to make our voices very clear. We have to be leaders. Men will follow us when they respect us. But if, they, if we don't make our voices clear, they're going to treat us like we're nothing. Nothing. They're going to use us over and over and over again. I don't care if you're a wife or you're a porn star or you're a poor woman, like in working in a hotel, you know, like these poor women who are making the beds, you know, 2,000 beds a day, and then they have these horrible men with so much money and power hiding in the closets, waiting to jump out and rape them as they're making the bed. I mean, why do we all have to put up with this? Why aren't we out there fighting for all these women who work in the hotels, all these mothers with their children who are coming over the border? trying to get asylum for us because our policies are making all of these problems in their countries. Why aren't we doing anything about it? Yeah, that's, it's interesting. It's like a lot of what's come up with the Me Too movement is like the only women who sort of get justice are these women who are famous. Like a lot of, a lot of the women are just as well known to us as the men or, or, or sort of secondarily well known. And so we, and they might have had like just a huge support network. And then they're all these sort of these voices that like don't get, like don't really have the power to take somebody down. You know, like some people will listen to like, I don't know, uh, Ashley Judd, but they might not listen to like 
uh, an anonymous, like, yeah, like hotel worker or something. Well, um, DSK so was brought down by a hotel I know, I know. Worker, <laughs> I was so about come to on, say that's you know, probably the not head of the monetary fund. And yeah, he, but she paid for it so dearly. I, you know what? But, you know, 10, 20 years from now, she, she's going to feel really good. And we all should be praising her to the skies, too. Well, I think, like, those women are being praised a lot more than they were even just a couple of years ago. Like, I think, yeah. like, even, again, like, I, I use me as a benchmark because, like, like, I think of myself as, like, pretty good feminist. And, like, even I sort of, like, made excuses for some of these men. Like, oh, we don't know. Maybe not DSK. Are you kidding? Not DSK, but somebody, like, who's, who's a good example, like... I don't know, like, uh, I just... Oh, like uh, that actor who, like, the the Affleck guy? Uh, oh, no, but no, I... The, the brother, the brother. Oh, Casey. Casey. Well, I didn't know about Casey until Me Too was, like, way happening. But, yeah. like, what's an example? I don't know, like, even some people... Who? I have Franken. Franken. Yeah, that, I have a problem with that, too. No, well, I, people, I do have like, a problem with Like, people in my life, that. like, I was talking... Uh, a couple, like a couple days ago, about this guy who I still think of very fondly, um, and he like got accused of sexual assault a few times Tom in, Broca? in college. Oh, no. <laughs> the guy I know, a <laughs> guy my age, and like you know, like in 2007 when I was in college, 2006, mm -hmm. and um, I was sort of like, well, I'm friends with this guy, like I'm not gonna get involved. Like I don't really know. Like who knows who these women are? Like, uh. and now I just look look back on that, and I'm like. Oh God! Like I don't know if it's because I'm older and wiser, or because like the conversation has changed. But all of a sudden, I realize like even I make excuses, and if I'm making excuses, probably a lot of other people are making excuses. Yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. um, okay. A lot of wives are making excuses. Yeah, you're so wives you're, and girlfriends. You're so mad at them. like Georgina. <laughs> Georgina, like the wife of Harvey Weinstein. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really disgusting. She had to know what was happening. Yeah. She made a deal. I think for a lot of women who make a deal because the money is there and they know that the money is paying for everything and it's paying for the kids' private schools and it's paying for the houses here and it's paying for their their careers as clothing designers or whatever, yeah, I, I hold them responsible for the monstrous behavior. Not totally responsible. Of course, it's number one, the male. Completely. But they are complicit. Yeah. yeah absolutely complicit. Y and that that's... There's something wrong with that. Yeah. Well, you know who like the page, I, I really wish I had um, written down this slide number, but um, I feel like a lot of these women are like the patron saint of like sort of like like the religion that's not like organized religion that is like Donna Frato <laughs> religion. What, and the, the mother of God? <laughs> yeah. And the patron saint of a woman who is not complicit and like paid for it is the Good Samaritan photo mm -hmm. of, if you see, the, I'm sorry to like not have this slide, but if you see this this woman, um, she's at in like a doctor's office and she's like, she has like a... Um, she's screaming. She's Her screaming, yeah, she's screaming and, and the story, behind, well, explain the story behind that. Well, she was, um, it was late at night and she heard a banging on the door. It was the winter time and... Um, she went to the door and she saw a naked woman there with a baby in her arms. And, and her hair was all disheveled and, and the woman begged to come in, so she let her in. And this that's poor, it, that's it. This poor <laughs> woman um, had been running from house to house and no one would let her in. But she let, she let the woman in and, and, and then she found out that this poor woman had been locked in the basement by her husband for days. He wouldn't let her feed her her baby. She had another daughter in some of the other pictures in the book, Living with the Enemy, you see the, the other children of the injured woman. And, and he just kept beating her and raping her. He wouldn't let her take care of her. And he was doing crack and all of that. So this woman got very upset. And she said, what kind of a man would do this? And so she went out and she knocked on the door and she confronted him. They both went in, and he started pulling at his wife's hair. Um, and then she said, what kind of a man are you? You're not really a man. You attack a woman like this, you are not a man. And he chased after her out of the house with a knife, and he, cut, he sliced her hand like that. So, yes, she was getting her hand sewed up. But I heard her say to the battered woman, you know, just don't go back. If you don't go back to him, then everything I've suffered tonight will be worth it. So I've been trained by the women. I've been trained. I know 
that it is so dangerous for us to go back. No matter how sorry we feel for them, no matter how much a part of them they, they are in our, in our bodies and in our hearts, we can't... Is this an earthquake? Oh, my God. That's mother. The mother <laughs> of God is saying, yes, we can't go the back. The patron saint of don't not go being back. complicit. I don't, I'm not, I don't <laughs> like the whole movement about why we stay and why we don't leave and all of that. I think we've been hearing this for so long, all these stories about why we don't leave. We really need, and that's what, I am unbeatable. I started a campaign years ago. And that's, I look for women who I know are not going to go back and I want to hear their stories because I think that their stories are the only ones that we really need to understand. And that's what women need to keep hearing over and over and over again, why you must never go back and why it's going to be so much better for you if you don't go back. What did that woman do? <laughs> Which woman? The woman she that was, was taken in. She didn't, she didn't go back and she filed charges and... And do you know that there was going to be a trial? And like the day before the trial, her husband had a heart attack and he died. It was like divine intervention. So I went with her to Mother the cemetery. <laughs> we wandered all around in the cemetery. And she said, you know, I never could find him when he was alive. And it feels appropriate that I can't find him in the cemetery either. <laughs> yeah. um, I, one more thing. Okay, I yes, also please. think that for a lot of these women, when we meet, a lot of the battered women when we meet, and I photograph them, and it's not just a little snap picture, I stay with them. I stay with them for weeks, months, sometimes years. Not always living in their house, but I try to get in there as much as I can, and I keep talking to them and helping them to see it's going to be okay. We have to work with the courts, we have to work, but you have to talk. You have to, women have to learn how to really talk about what's happened. None of these women <laughs> have ever been hunted down by the men. None of these women have ever had the men come after them after like, like the unbeatable woman, Sarah. In the end, you know, her picture was put on the side of Vanderbilt University, 20 feet high, the battered woman who knows now that she is an unbeatable woman, that she has her rights. Her husband didn't try to come after her. Some do. Yeah, some, some do. Some do, but not when they have a story that comes out in all of the local papers. That's what I do. I'm not just doing things under the cover. Yeah. I get these stories published. I go and speak about them on all the local radio stations. And I try to educate the men, too. Well, that's I try that. to educate everybody. I'm not, I, I, and I educate their sons, and I educate their daughters. It's not just about taking pictures for me. Pictures are just like the first step. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. I, I, I feel like you're, you get very unapologetically involved in your, in your subjects' lives. Like, and, and it was sort of obvious to me, um, even without talking to you about this, because what, what Donna did was like, well, as soon as she said like we were going to do this thing, she was like, come <laughs> over, which is like clearly what she does with everybody. She's like, come <laughs> over. And I came over, and of course, like, and then I came over a few times, like every time I came over there, there was like a couple other people who were like told to come over. Um, no, no, no. Most of these people are like, we, you're we friends. do things. No, no, no. They're or friends. A lot of friends. I know. And people you work with. Yeah. People I'm not you work saying with randoms. Me. They were random to me. <laughs> but anyway, so. I had to pick up homeless people too. <laughs> right yeah, you're feeling the time. But so like Donna just like showed me a bunch of photos, like most of these photos that, that we're seeing tonight, sort of without telling me the stories first. And like just from the very beginning, you could tell that you weren't just documenting, especially since sometimes you're in the photos. Like one photo that really struck me that you guys will probably see, that's, that's Donna's baby. <laughs> that's me. That's Fanny. Yeah. That's Fanny, the, the baby who will then one day get her picture taken. Um, in total ecstasy. After when she's 48 hours. Yeah. Um, With only a, a shot of 100 proof vodka. <laughs> just one. No drugs. Um, yeah, so like I just, I, I felt like you sometimes are, there was a photo, sorry, what, what I was saying was that there was a photo of you in a woman's prison. Yeah. On, on the bottom bunk of a woman's yeah, prison. Yeah, I sleep in the prisons something. with the women. I talk the wardens into letting me actually spend the night in there. Because if I don't hang out in people's homes and really hang out with them, over a period of time, I don't know nothing about them. Yeah. 
I don't like these. For me, it's not enough just to meet people and say, let's take a nice portrait and blah, 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 beautiful light and all that. I'm not interested in that kind of photography. Um, I think this is a really good time to open it up for questions. Um, it's because I feel like um, at this point where people are already shouting stuff out and they really oh, want to talk. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that okay if we... I can't see the audience, but... <laughs> um, Oh, sorry, she's, yeah, it's, I, I'm sorry, that was a little bit premature, but she has, there is a mic if anyone wants questions. Sure, so we'll start um, Q&A. If you Here do have a go. question, raise your hand, we'll come to you with a microphone, or just remember to speak clearly into the microphone. We'll start here in the front. Okay. Hi, so how do you reconcile place and time? If you go back... 15, 20 years when people were, had a completely different attitude, both men and women. It wasn't always the same as you can apply the thought process today. Mm -hmm. I'm curious as to how you feel about Al Franken. Yeah, I, I, I really, I'm glad you asked about Al Franken. I, I, I was appalled at the way Kristen Gillibrand really forced him out and he didn't have he wasn't able to speak, and you know, I I think he was set up, definitely, and 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 I was really appalled at how he was treated. Um, there's there, the, I'm having a problem with the Democratic Party altogether, to tell you the truth. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, I I don't think they're in the reality at all. There it That's is. That's the mom photo, my favorite photo. That's beautiful, right? <laughs> it's great. Um, well, but but so but what, what you originally asked was sort of like how do you how do you reconcile like uh, how things were perceived back then versus today? Um, in so far as uh, like things that sexual were okay. harassment and social behavior. I mean, the seventies and sixties versus today. You know, like with the seventies. I mean, the, I'm a product of the nineteen of the 60s. I mean, that's when I, I was graduating from high school in 1968. And um, we didn't trust anybody over 30. We didn't talk to any of these old guys. You know, we were just amongst ourselves and we were ex experimenting with our sexuality and listening to music and reading and having fun and going on camping trips. And it was a very different time, but whenever there were any men who made untoward advances to me, I would just say, you know, I'm not interested. I mean, I've, I've gone through it many times. As a photographer, I've had to deal with it with people like Gay Talese and Jerzy Kozinski, and I can name to you, like, you know, 50 men who are well-known men, but who made these kinds of advances. And what do I say? Go ahead and do whatever you want to do. I'll take your picture, but do whatever you want to do. You know, we have to speak our mind, but we, I don't, I'm not going to get cowered or embarrassed or scared with a man. And I, I guess I really want to impart that message to, to women today, to not be intimidated by them. We don't have to put up with it. So, so what you're saying is like, Women always kind of knew that it was bullshit. It, it was always going on, and we knew it was bullshit. And, you know, for every woman, it's, we have a different... We, every woman has a different response to it. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that... I, I think that we've moved into a, a very exciting period in, in the history of women right now. And I'm actually glad that women today are speaking up about it and they're and they're holding men accountable in in the photography profession um, the female photographers have been so quiet for so long I never was and I but I'm not with an agency I've always been independent and now it's all coming out about all these agency photographers who've been treating women s in such disgusting ways some of the most famous male photographers out there, such disgusting ways. And the women were quiet about it. 
for whatever reason, you know, they were quiet. They didn't want to say. But we're in the business of uncovering things, of telling the truth. We're journalists. We're photojournalists. How come we're so quiet about sexual harassment with these guys? Whether it's in workshops or in the agencies or when you're on assignment, you know, with a lot of women. When I worked at Life magazine back in the 80s, I'd see a lot of women writers and reporters who would go out with these male writers and they would be they would be having to sleep with the guys all the time and be in, even though they were reporters they were acting more like little gophers for the men because the men were more prestigious they had more power they had more privilege and the women would put up with it and I would say to them why do you do that it's so beneath you you're never going to get anywhere, and you're not going to get any respect from anybody. So I, I'm just going to keep saying it's not popular. It's not the politically correct way to talk, and I don't really care. I'm not politically correct. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing wrong with the way you're talking. Just to tell you. There's nothing wrong with the way you're talking. Thank you. Sorry. What ah, you're say. my bathroom. I'm your bathroom your friend. friend. Yeah, that's good. We were all talking <laughs> very frankly. Weird. That's great. That's great. You said that it's not politically correct. It's mm -hmm. not whatever. It's completely perfect. And <laughs> to not put up with it. Anybody who disagrees with you, mm -hmm. fuck them. Excuse yeah, me. Yeah, fuck them. That's what I feel so too. Sorry. Are you tape recording it? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I have a question right sure. here. And Hi there, I'm over here. Okay. I wanted to get a little more clarity on how you were in the right place to take the photo of the woman who was being treated for getting stabbed by the... The Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, um, that was um, while I was doing a story for Life magazine, and I was working in Minneapolis for about four months, um, living in shelters, riding with the cops, living in emergency rooms, going to the batterers programs. Um, when I'm working like that, I, I live in the hospital emergency rooms. I live in the shelters. I ride with the cops usually about 12 to 15 hours a day. So in that situation, I was there when she came in. And I, I never would expect an emergency room doctor to 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 explain why I'm there. I know they can't explain it even. They don't even understand it themselves, why I should be allowed to photograph in there. Um, but when I get permission to do my work, then it's up to me to explain it to the people who are coming in, why it's important to, to let me photograph whatever they're going through. And it doesn't always work. A lot of people say, no, I'm sorry, I'm too sad, I'm too worried, I'm sorry. And I totally respect that. But if I am able to put my case across clearly enough and everybody involved feels safe enough to let me photograph, I mean, because everybody has to sign a release. All of the pictures that you've seen, the domestic violence pictures, they all have ironclad releases. That's a, like a consent form, but it's also why I like those releases is because it also gives them a chance to really know what they're doing, what they're agreeing to, and then they have my information. They can always call me anytime and say, no, 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 you, you can't use this picture anymore. Um, but I was there, and then I got to know them, and then it just goes on from there. Does anyone ever say, like, actually don't use that photo right afterwards? Um, yeah, a couple people have. Um, one woman, actually, uh, who, had, who had had her, her um, ear ripped off by her abuser, and, um, and her nose was also, like, so badly beaten that that had to be sewed on. And she gave me permission to to publish the picture. It was in Life magazine. She gave me permission for that. But then many years later, um, I, uh, a group called, um, they're, they're based in California, in San Francisco. Um, 
the name is like slipping my mind right now, but I used to do a lot of work with them. But what happened was the woman who ran this, this uh, organization, uh, Family Violence Prevention Fund, they, they took that picture without asking my permission, and they used it in one of their big campaigns. And so this woman was living in Chicago, and all of a sudden one day, many years later, she was going up an escalator, and she saw this picture hanging like 30 feet oh from the gosh. ceiling. Wow. And she said, Donna, this, my children saw this. Oh. They recognized me. It's very terrible. Please, you know, don't use that picture anymore. And so I didn't, and I was very tough with the Family Violence Prevention Fund, too, because n nobody is allowed to take my pictures and use them for anything unless they are working with me. I mean, I've had a lot of really kind of crazy things happen with people who want to use my pictures um, or who want to use my access. Mm. You know, the access that I get has been pretty extraordinary. But it's because I'm a believer. I really believe that I not only have a right to be there, I have a responsibility to be there. And it's been crazy how some of these photographers, the really famous ones like Annie Leibovitz and Richard Avedon, actually have had their lawyers and people call me to ask me to get them into battered women's shelters. Mm. And, and like, so that they can, and you know, Annie Leibovitz's lawyer said to me, I said, you mean... I mean, we're going to be working on this together. I'm going to get her into the shelter, and then we're going to work on this. And she said, no, no, no. Annie is the photographer. You're going to get her into the shelter. So you can just imagine what my response was. We have a question in the back here. Yeah. Hi, Donna. Hi. Big, big fan. You're just Thank you. speaking right to me. How would you suggest we restructure the way that we gender socialize young girls and then women? is one part of the question. And the second one would be, what are your thoughts on women policing other women on behalf of the, um, on men and the patriarchy that we've created? Well, I think that something really important to do, um, especially in, in schools and college campuses, but also at work, when we know that there is a guy who has, has uh, assaulted a woman, um, used any means to um, take advantage of her, uh, that women around her, friends, colleagues, whatever, we, I, I really believe in shaming those men and putting their pictures out there and creating a, a lot of conversation about this. Um, and I like the women who do, I like, like the woman at Columbia who'd been raped and the school wasn't really um, taking it that seriously. So she just started carrying her mattress around on her back every day. I like, I like women to use more performance and drama and talking about it, like get it out there. And so I think that we have to support each other. Like some women would probably say, no, I know that guy. He's not so bad. He wouldn't do that. Well, I, I really think that we have, to, we have to start supporting each other a whole lot more than we have been in the past. Um, that's, the, that's the answer to your second question, right? The first question, how would I like to see the genders like coming together, like so socializing. Socializing. Yeah. The way that we put young girls on a pedestal and you know encourage them to be pretty or be saved in fairy tales or yeah, or I'm totally against that. I'm totally against the pedestal. Absolutely, I don't think anybody belongs on the pedestal. But I really feel that women have to be respected and honored. And girls should, we have to raise our girls to honor themselves. We really have to help them to understand how important they are, how important their bodies are, where their bodies are going to take them. Um, in terms of not, a, you know, just like today, nowadays, there are a lot of girls who think that it's okay to have anal sex, it's okay to give blowjobs, as long as you don't have actual vaginal sex. Now, they're getting all these kinds of crazy ideas out there. 
And we've got to talk about this with the young girls. And we've got to really talk with our, our sons and our grandsons and the, the young men that we meet ab about all of this, too. We've, we, somehow we have to make females more real and stop objectifying them. Um, and I think that it's really important for young women to do many other things besides getting their nails done or going shopping or having their hair done or all that kind of stuff, these really vapid um, activities that the girls are supposed to be into, and teach them to like participate more in sports, in reading, in, in doing other things besides just thinking about how they look. And unfortunately, our society is so obsessed about how women look. You know, the plastic surgery thing is way out of control. For older women, younger women, girls, it's just really disgusting to me. You yeah, know, but Donna, honestly, <laughs> I think it's just, I, I really have a problem with it. You yeah, know? but don't you also sort of support women doing what is pleasurable? I mean, maybe not plas plastic surgery is not ple pleasurable to get, but it can be pleasurable to, the results can be pleasurable to women, like self-care type stuff can be pleasurable. Like, are you saying that women shouldn't do that wholesale or they just shouldn't feel not pressured so to much. do it? Not so much, not so pressured and it shouldn't be, it really, really, I don't think it should be as much as it is. It shouldn't be something that we push young girls into doing at a young, at, at, an, at a certain age. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the, the beauty contest girls are just getting younger and younger. And, and we're, I, I, I don't see any pleasure in that. It's just all about competition and having people pay attention to you and getting rewarded for being pretty. I really don't think that's good. No, I mean, I, I, I don't either, but I also, I, mean, know I also know that you wouldn't want to... Yeah, no, I think we understand each other because I feel like you're saying people should, that shouldn't be an expectation on women. Women should do some stuff that make them happy. Um, and then, you know, they would sort of indulge their own fantasies rather than, like, trying to live up to other people's. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Kevin. Hi. I, My I dear friend. Like, I don't think I need the microphone. <laughs> Well, because it's re getting recorded, so oh. maybe we, yeah. <laughs> Great. Great, thank you. I'll try not to shout. <laughs> um, interesting segue, because the what you just said about objectifying women kind of led me to a question I was thinking of asking anyway. You were somewhat flattering toward Al Goldstein and even Larry Flint, a little more than I thought. And last year when he died, a very polarizing figure um, in, among women was Hugh Hefner. And you really heard both sides of that and yeah. obviously he you know the the rap is of course he he ruined generations of women trying to make every girl want to look like a playboy bunny with right. a little cotton tail but then of course he also was a big supporter of liberal causes and of course without Hugh Hefner there would not have been Larry Flint so I'm not sure if you would actually distinguish between the two I'm curious I do thoughts. actually distinguish between the two though I think there's a big difference between Larry Flint and and um and Hugh Hefner um I, I guess for me, Larry Flint was, I think he respected the realness of women a lot more than Hugh Hefner did. And he, he was, as, you know, he was very loyal to his wife who was pretty sick too and he was very, very loyal to her. I don't think he ever recovered when she died um, from losing her. Uh, I mean, it's not like I think Hustler magazine was great. I don't really like these kinds of magazines too much. I'm not crazy about Playboy, um, and I and I, but I I I guess I'm a real. I I like I like women to look real, and I so for me, the women who are in Hustler were a lot better than the women in in Playboy because in Playboy they were just so fake looking, and. And every woman had to look the same to please Hugh Hefner, whereas I felt like Larry Flint was, I mean, he just sort of appreciated the whole package of a woman as she really was. 
Hmm? I have a question back here. Mm -hmm. um, I, hi. Hi. I just wanted to speak a little bit more about the objectification of women. And with Hugh Hefner, Larry Flint, and the other Who is man, the other? Oh, Al Gore. The other man who was there who I'd never <laughs> Screwed, heard of before. Right? But objectification to me is objectification, whether it's in Vogue, whether it's Larry Flint, whether it's anybody. Mm -hmm. And young girls grow up, and you see it on a post, you see it on a billboard, mm -hmm. you see it in a magazine. And whether it's, you know, Richard Avedon taking pictures or whether it's any of those, I don't think they're respecting women. I think they're making a lot of money off of women. But then those women allow that to happen. Do you know what I mean? They don't, they don't say, hey, you know, because they see an opportunity. Because for them, their sexuality or their, their bodies are their business. So it's so complicated. It is. It's and just so complicated. And I, it's hard to say, oh, he's a pig and she's just an innocent bystander. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I mm -hmm. looked at him with those two women. They looked like they were having a great time. Mm -hmm. uh, what the guy. Um, oh. Yeah. But, you know, at the same time, her boobs looked like she had had them done to the bursting point. Yeah. And, and that doesn't speak to me that a woman who is comfortable with herself... Yeah, and I just well, she's in that business too. She's she was she's a porn she is, star, but you can and pretty much bet many of those porn stars come from very dysfunctional youths. They don't, you know, many of them have been abused sexually as young women, or they come from you know places. so many so, women have many is, girls have been abused, and they don't yes. all become porn stars either. There's so many, no, but many so oh, much abuse going no, but on. A lot of them who enter porn a lot of them are coming from abuse families. And it's also for, because I, I have photographed a lot in the porn world, yeah. you know, and I, I, I was actually quite amazed to see how smart a lot of yes. they, a lot of them are, the men and the women. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it's partly. a business and they make good money and, and they, they make can't make that money anywhere else, really. So but it's sort of an age thing. Yeah, it is objective, it, but they choose it. If they're choosing it, but it's different from it's being trafficked. But yeah. are they really supporting it? Do you know what I mean? Are, are, are they choosing it when this is the way the society works? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a very complicated. I'm not saying there's an answer, but it's, I think it's it is very more complicated. complicated than we think. I yeah, think absolutely. I think I have a, oh. part of, when I think about how the next generation is coming along in the Me Too movement and all that, I think a huge part of it is the strength within us women and about not shaming each other. Whether you're mm -hmm. a porn star or you don't ever want to have sex, I think the respect that we have towards one another is what gives us strength so that men don't objectify us or use us in ways that we don't want. But it's in that, like in my household, the word slut is not allowed to be used. Mm -hmm. I don't ever want it to be used when they become teens because if they have a friend who chooses to have sex every single night of the week with a different guy, that is her business with her body and that's something that she's doing. Mm -hmm. And I want my daughters to understand that may not be our motto, but let's support any, because men don't have that problem. They can have sex every night of the week and it's totally cool. So I, for me, the next generation, and I loved your questions, was that, that I think in support of one another, then when someone does get abused, we don't go immediately go, oh, I wonder if it, you know, she put it out there too much, or I wonder, we immediately support instead of doubt. And yeah, I think that changes, and when we also stop having shame about sex, about enjoying sex, then there is no control from men. Th you can't control someone who feels no shame about something that they're proud of. That's and there's so much fear about sex too. And it, look, it, there's a lot of fear about sex for young women, young girls, because of the the um, issues with getting pregnant, and it's really hard for to understand what your body wants, what's going to give you pleasure when you have to be worried about getting pregnant all the time. That's a big issue for younger women. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I, I, for, like, for various magazines, I used to do a lot of stories about sex education in high schools. And... And it was really impressive to go into these schools where they were learning about everything in their sophomore years. And I noticed how in so many of this, these classes, 
the girls were a lot more educated about sex and they knew how to be protected because they were like the daughters of the revolution. Their mothers were the mm -hmm. ones who had been through it all in the 70s. And so they were educating their daughters to always take a condom with them when they left the house. Always be prepared. Talking about sex. We've got to talk about it. What's wrong with talking about it? And what's wrong with being protected all the time? And I think, I think actually you and I have talked a lot about how that sort of has to be the next step of like the Me Too movement where it's not just like these guys are assholes, but it's also like, like, like raising, ki raising women, raising girls really girls. To, to sort of like think about what would, what, what would make them happy in terms of sex. Like, yes, protect yourself, use a condom, like all that, keep your wits about you, but also like think like sort of like let your fantasies like be free and like pursue what you want sexually and like sort of n get to know yourself, masturbate and all kinds of things yeah. that would really like let you be able Absolutely. to A, know if something was going wrong, like if somebody was sort of violating your boundaries and B, like sort of just thinking about sex is not a scary thing, but as a, a pleasurable thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We have a question in the back here. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, so I was really struck by when you spoke earlier about the women that um, like clean hotel rooms and how they're being victimized by men who are hiding in closets and going to you know, attack them um, and sort of in the vein of being non-politically correct, your comment was that they should you know, find another job. And the idea no, no, of did that- Did I say that, that they should? I didn't say that they should find another job. Uh, no, I absolutely did not say that. Oh, maybe I misheard. What, yeah, 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 what, yeah, what yeah. were you saying? No, I wasn't saying anything about it. I said that we women should be supporting these women. You know, when you go into hotels, talk to them. G get to know them. Um, but support them. when, when They have to do. The, they, they're supporting their families. These right. women, how are they going to find other jobs? I was not saying that they can't. But I'm putting the blame on the men who think that they have the right to do that. And I'm saying for a lot of, we're, we're, we're always with the Me Too movement, we're talking about the more well-off, the more educated, the women who have the great jobs, you know, usually white women um, who are actresses, whatever. We're not talking about the women who work in the fields, the wor who work in the hotels, who are going through unbelievable sexual abuse. We're not really thinking about what they're suffering with. And I, I would like us all to be thinking about that. I, didn't, I wasn't saying that they shouldn't do these jobs. What, you know, it's, no, you Gosh. didn't miss here. So but what were you going to say oh anyway? Wait, so what would your <laughs> suggestion be for women who have sort of all of these other things on top of them other than just patriarchy, who are women of color, who are poor, who are undocumented, who don't have the option of speaking up because their livelihood simply depends on the fact that they have this job and there are all of these people above them who have all of this privilege and power which they don't have. You know, that's, uh, what do you think? I think well, that's yeah, a no. really tough question because for, for a lot of women who, you know, a lot of women don't have the support of their families or friends or people in good places that can help them get better jobs. Um, they're just trying to do, and I, I've been there. I've had to work like that in the past. I mean, I've been a secretary. I've worked cleaning houses. I have done that work. It's, you know, it seems like something that, okay, we do when we're younger, but what, what upsets me is when I see older women who are still having to do that work. And, it, and they're ba breaking their backs. And I, I don't know what to suggest for them, except that whenever we go to hotels, we should always leave big tips for them, all of us. You know, L leave a big tip. Don't just rely on, th on them being paid by their salaries. Leave them, you know, $10 a day, $20 a day. Leave them some money because they deserve it. They work really hard. But so I would say that that's one thing that you can do. What were you going to say, well, Nona? No, but just that, that you, again, like you and I have talked about this, I think, is that, um, is that like it's that basic concept of solidarity of sort of like, you know, um, getting everybody on board and having sort of like the old idea of consciousness raising with, with everybody and sort of like having unions and like these sort of like collective power structures so that you're not just on an island by yourself like going to your boss or HR or whatever that you like know that you sort of have this predetermined support um, 
So, I mean, and that's a good idea. And that's kind Definitely. of like what we've talked about in journalism, like, because, mm-hmm. you know, like the media has had like their m- Me Too moment too. And like, um, I used to work for Splinter, which is part of Gizmodo Media, which is unionized. And um, we talked a lot about sort of like what the protocol is for sexual harassment and stuff. And, and there, there was this sort of like neutral third party this union, which like sort of had this predetermined protocol that was like, yeah, you can come to us if you don't feel um, comfortable t- talking talking to HR. And that's sort of like an example of some collective action that you can take without having to just put your, I think what she was referring to is like how, how you said earlier in the talk sort of like, well, who cares if you lose your job, you should speak up. Um, and I don't know if you were talking about the hotel workers. No, no, no. But you were sort of talking about yourself. Yeah, me. like, like, right, exactly. You like, know? you had said it and then lost jobs because of it. Yeah. And that it was worth it to I you. I always got fired. But, like, ideally, you wouldn't have to lose the job at all because people would have your back, you know? Absolutely. Right. Mm-hmm. right. I understand. That's the only way it will change. That's really the only way it will change. If women will start speaking up more regularly mm-hmm. and helping each other, standing by each other, not we we just can't work against each other. Like sharing your salaries, like how much people make. Yeah, I mean. When, when I've been in agencies or in galleries and I find out that one woman has really been harassed, sexually harassed, you know, I can't, I can't stay in that place. I can't keep having a working relationship with a man who's running a gallery, even if he says he's going to give me the biggest show on earth. I have to leave him. Even that, okay, I don't have a gallery. But I cannot tolerate when a woman comes to me and says that so-and-so has talked to her in a very disrespectful way. Then I have to say it to this man. I don't expect everybody to be like I am. It's not easy. You know, my father was a heart surgeon, but he wasn't fiscally responsible. And there, there was no, no nothing nothing that came out of it but what i'm saying is is that there's 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 something more to it than than the money and and at least for me but i i know that i don't have 10 children and my daughter has grown up i don't even have two i you know if i had five children it would be or even two children and it was all on me and i didn't have a partner then I'd probably have to find other ways to make it work at that job. But, and there are many other ways. I can't come up with all the different solutions for every woman who's going through this kind of stuff out there today, except to say that we all have to speak out and talk about it. And we, you know, the fact is, is that there are a lot of good men out there. There are a lot of good men in the photography business that I really respect and trust, and I would trust them anywhere. There are just a few bad apples, but we have to talk about those bad apples. We can't just gloss it over because they're well-known and they take great pictures that are, seem like they're so humanitarian. We can't just give them a pass with that, that they take humanitarian-esque pictures and seem to care about people, but then they treat women like shit. I have a last question right yeah. here in the middle. <laughs> yes, uh, hi there. I, I was just wondering if the, the honesty and the warmth of your photographic images and what you've been saying and, and what you were working towards, if that, um, if that ha- 
I, I get the feeling that would resonate so powerfully in other countries and would be accepted so Thank you. so well, say like in, in South Africa, mm -hmm. in, in other countries. And I just wondered if you have any, excuse the pun, any exposure in, in that other Yes, country. thank you. I mean, in South Africa, actually, I, I went there for the New York Times magazine um, in 1999 to do a story on domestic violence. And I talk them into it. All, all the stories that I do, I talk the editors into. They don't hand me these stories. <laughs> I almost have to go in there and like beat them up a little bit so that they give me, because I just want to get out there. So I went to um, Soweto, and I started this work on domestic violence. And then I found out that the big story there was on child sexual assault. It was so rampant then. It was just, just shocking how bad it was and how the poor women just were working as hard as they could to take care of their children. But oftentimes they were at work and then these things would happen to the children on the way to school, when they got home, on the buses. I mean, it was just, it was so bad. So I changed the story to chi child sexual assault. And, um, and it was so inspiring to see how the women and the young girls were working together to point out who the rapists were, even if it was their fathers or uncles or the bus drivers or the neighbors. They had to go after them and point them out, and then they would be arrested. Now, this sometimes was very dangerous for the children, and the there was a lot of retaliation against some of these children. But with the one case that I was able to follow all the way through, um, this little girl was so brave, and she, she prosecuted him for raping her, for sodomizing her, for giving her such terrible diseases. And she, she, her testimony put him away. And when and I was photographing in the courtroom, so the judge in the beginning was a little nervous about having me in there, but I was able to get into that courtroom and photograph it, so it became real. It was put into the New York Times Sunday Magazine. It gave her that power. It gave that little girl, Miss Cindy, the power. Honestly, I can only work on one person at a time. And when I'm with that person, I give them everything I got. Mm -hmm. and just try to help them to get to see what they have to do and then work with all the women, like I worked with the woman around this little girl, worked with her mother. I mean, that little girl got a very big lesson, and so did her mom, and, and it was all uh, happening because of the next-door neighbor who saw how this little girl was walking, how much pain she was in, and she brought her into the, into the hospital. So... You know, a lot of times everybody sees things happening, but they don't say anything. They don't want to get involved. That's the worst you can do, is not get involved. Good, good. It's incumbent on all of us to get involved. I just did a, a workshop on uh, domestic violence working in a battered women's shelter in, in Italy, in Palermo. And I took five photographers who were in the workshop, and I stuck them in these three different battered women shelters in Palermo. Nobody had ever seen what happens in these shelters. There's so many women dying in Italy, but you read these stories, but you don't know what anybody's doing to stop it. You don't even know if there are shelters there. But my photographers got such incredible work. They did such incredible work, and they, the stories were beautiful and powerful, and we're going to premiere some of these pictures at the W. Eugene Smith ceremony in New York in October. Um, and we're bringing in Letizia Battaglia, who also is an unbelievably powerful uh, Sicilian photographer who did a, work, a book on the mafia. So she's going to be... We showed the photographer's work to her, she was blown away, and now she wants to have a show there at her gallery in Palermo. 
So this story, now I'm trying to raise money because photography is expensive. To be able to show my photographer's work off to its best, I need to raise money to put the pictures together and then start to travel it around Italy. But I've been wanting to get into that country for a long time because there are so many problems with violence. And you, know, you think it's a country of love and, and good spaghetti and vino and happiness, and, but there's so much violence going on there. So we just have to Join talk about in. it. <laughs> Join me in thanking um, Donna, Nona. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you Nona. Yeah.